What's up, guys? Hey, welcome to uh, a Sunday morning with us again on the internet. So I uh, hope you guys are doing well. We are diving into week two of our Journey of a King series. And so last week we looked at Saul's life uh, because Saul was David's predecessor to the throne of Israel, right? And so we wanted to set up what he's walking into. And so Saul uh, did a great job. He, uh, man, pursued the Lord and tried to honor him the best he could. But Saul let pride get in the way. And he let pride derail his relationship with the Lord. And so one of the things we took away from last week was only partial obedience is still disobedience. And so that's something you want to remember and learn from. And so then we enter the mighty David today. And so you'd expect someone like that to be king, right? The mighty, uh, amazing, coming in triumphantly David. Uh, and someone who looks and acts the part like Saul did. That's not how God rolls. Check it out in 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 1 and then skip down. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king amongst his sons." Okay, so uh, then Samuel goes to make a sacrifice, and he invites Jesse and his sons to come along with him. Okay, now skip down to verse 6. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, listen to this, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now skip to verse 11. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him back. Uh, now he was ready, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And so to sum up the rest of the chapter, because I think it sets up next week and weeks going forwards as to how David got his foot in the door of the palace, uh, Saul was tormented by a harmful spirit. And so Saul's servants found a guy who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. And so David played a harp for Saul. Right, so I personally have never met a man skillful at war, had a strong presence, and spoke well who could also play the harp. Right, makes you think differently about harp players. Right, uh, and so whenever the evil spirit would torment Saul, Saul would play his harp for him, and the spirit would leave Saul. Crazy, right? And so Saul ended up loving David like a son and made him his armor bearer. And so I mentioned that, like I said, because it sets up future weeks. But what do I want you to see from this, what we've read this morning? How do you apply this to your life? God used David because he was a clean vessel. God, David was willing and obedient to step up where God asked. God can use that. So what's the difference between being clean on the inside and being clean on the outside? Well, Jesus spells that out in Matthew chapter 23. Check it out. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Right? In other words, you're tithing these tiny herbs and you haven't even paid attention to the big stuff. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness." 
so you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Man, those are strong words. Why does the heart and what's on the inside matter more to God than the outside? I, I mean, if I look the part and I say I'm giving credit to God for stuff and I'm trying to represent him the best I can, why would Jesus have an issue with that? Because it's not genuine. He knows what's on your heart. He knows what's genuine and what is actually outward, uh, just overflow from what's in your heart. And so God has called us to something deeper and something better than a t-shirt wearing Sunday morning Christian. Church is a bad hobby. I've said that before. If you're not in this to be a follower and you would rather have Jesus on the shelf, find a different hobby. Maybe one that doesn't require you to wake up early on Sundays and gather together with people, right? But if you desire and want to be a follower of Jesus, then jump in, man. Stop testing the water. And let me tell you the temperature of the water, right? Everybody's trying to test it. Let me tell you what the temperature is. Matthew 10 says that you will be hated. Epistles promise repeatedly that you will be persecuted. But Jesus also promises life and joy and freedom and peace. And so I think a lot of us want to figure out how to get one without the other or maybe think, yeah, I, I know what the Bible says, but I think I can figure out how to be a Christian without it being hard or interfering or disruptive to what I want to do. And that's simply not what Christianity is. You are either in or you're out. And so there's a song I really like by a friend of mine that I met up in Chicago years back. Uh, he's Jamaican, uh, and so he does have an interesting sound. Uh, and he wrote a song on this album called The Road, and the, uh, the song is called Diamond in the Dirt. Uh, and it's from a first-person point of view from Jesus. And I think it's super powerful. We're going to start right at the beginning of verse 2. So don't be distracted. Try to listen close, please. The passage he's referencing, I'm going to put on your screen for you uh, from Revelation 3. Rejected by the world, but there's something even worse. Revelation 3.20, I'm shunned by some within the church. Locked out of my own house, I'm on the porch and knocking. Folks all up in there screaming and singing, sinning and talking. Somebody better let me in. See, I don't mean to threaten, but everyone crying Jesus is not headed to heaven. I love you, but I don't need you, even if there were no church. The minerals of the Proclaim my beauty and worth Partaking my salvation Cause hell you want to avoid I'm not only your savior You need to crown me as lord It ain't that complicated So why you trying to make it Concerning my authority Either leave it or take it Try to straddle the fence You don't wanna go that route Indecision makes me sick I vomit you off my mouth I'm the king without a crown I'm a diamond in the dirt Even in my own church My lordship has been usurped I'm the diamond in the dirt You're either in or you're out there is no middle ground. You preach Christ or you preach your own comfort. You preach and show love or you do what you feel. Be ready and willing to be a useful instrument to be used by God. Y'all have a great table group. As you dive into this topic a little bit more in depth, know that I'm praying for you guys and I want you to have a great day, all right?